Hello, I'm Paul Evans and welcome to Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity that provides information and support for those of us who live with pain. This edition is made possible by Pain Concern's supporters and friends. More information on fundraising efforts is available on our Just Giving page at painconcern.org.uk. Now, all too often a media headline will grab our attention by announcing a major scientific breakthrough in the understanding and management of chronic pain. Sometimes it's bad science, but there again, it may have significance. So how do we differentiate between the two? Well, in today's programme, I want to feature two areas of research which really are helping in the understanding of pain. Professor Karen Davis is a neuroscientist at the University of Toronto in Canada. She's a leading figure in the field of brain imaging. That's an umbrella term to describe a number of different technologies that we, we have now available to us to look at how the brain is both functioning and how it looks structurally. The most popular uh, techniques that people know about and have heard about now is using MRI or magnetic resonance imaging to uh, peer into the workings of the brain. Are you telling me that you can take a picture of my brain and tell me how I'm feeling? Well, that's actually a good question and that's where we have to be very careful with what we mean by being able to know how somebody is feeling or thinking. We can't exactly do that. What we can do is we can look at how the brain is reacting or responding or is put together in terms of structure related to some sort of feeling or action. And we can make the correlation and the relationship between kind of these indirect measures that we see reflected in the brain and what you're thinking and feeling. So we can't exactly do in reverse what people would like us to do, which is look at a picture of the brain, as you, as you say, and be able to say with great certainty, ah, I know how you're thinking and feeling. What we can do is the measures that we take from the brain, which are kind of indirect measures of brain function, they're not direct measures. We could say, well, when you're thinking or feeling this, sometimes, many times, we see a reflection of that in the brain. In what way? How? Right. So there's two basic uh, types of imaging that we do using an MRI. Uh, one that you just mentioned, just kind of looking at what the brain looks like. Um, we have uh, kind of a little more sophisticated ways of taking that picture of the brain now and actually measuring and seeing how the various elements in the brain look. So the cells of the brain, which uh, comprise what's called the gray matter of the brain, and the connections between the cells and, and, and the brain, which is called the white matter. So I like to think of that as the kind of highways and cities of the brain. And so we can look at what that organization is like and try to see if there is signs of abnormalities in organization. So that's that's called structural imaging. The development of, of these kinds of very high-end structural imaging approaches uh, is, is relatively new on the scene. Perhaps in about the last five years have we gotten really good at that kind of assessment. What people are more familiar with and have seen in magazines and journals are the, those pretty colored pictures of the brain with kind of different colored blobs, if you will, uh, uh, lighting up, uh, so to say, in the brain. And that's, that's a technique called functional MRI. And what functional MRI really is, is a way of looking at indirect measure of the activity of the neurons. And it's indirect because it's, it's really a measure of the hemodynamic response. So the blood flow and the vascular response um, and, and need when neurons are active. Basically, when a, an area of the brain is working, is doing something, yes. blood flows to that. And you can, you can pick it up. So, so the pretty pictures that we see now published in magazines, um, what those really are, are color-coded uh, statistical maps. So they're actually color-coded based on the statistical difference between what's happening when somebody is thinking or doing something or when you apply some sort of stimulus, like a pain stimulus, at the difference between what's happening in that state and what's happening in some control or, or baseline state. So those are all statistical maps. If I experience pain, if you stick a pin on me now and I'm in your MRI scanner, you stick a pin in my hand, will a part of my brain light up? 
The short answer is yes, but not just one area. So it's important to realize that, that unlike many types of senses, uh, vision, for instance, where there's a very specialized area of the brain, the visual cortex that's involved in, in vision and critical for vision, for pain, you can't really point to any one particular area that's absolutely critical. If we could, that would be the magic bullet that surgeons could target and, and that drug companies could target to get rid of chronic pain. But the pain experience is really involving a network of brain areas um, all over the brain. So that's important to realize that, that these things work together to not only give you the pain per se, the ouch experience, but also the nuances of that pain. So whether it feels burning or prickling or stabbing or shooting, all those pain experiences are encoded in this network. And overlaying all that is all the emotional and cognitive experiences that accompany pain, which also kind of light up in the brain. So that may change depending on the mood that you're in, depending on your individual personality, depending on the context, uh, whether you're being distracted, whether you're multitasking something else. So, so the actual picture you get in the brain can vary tremendously from person to person depending on a variety of factors. So absence of some areas of the brain lighting up doesn't mean the person's not in pain. It just is one of the variabilities based on that individual experience. So when you come and poke a pin in my hand, the first thing I see is that you have a pin and you're coming towards me. So I have the fear because I know it's going to hurt and various other things and everything is sort of interacting with this pain center. Exactly, exactly. So one of the issues that have made it very difficult for us to say this is a pain network and nothing else in the brain is exactly the situation you just mentioned. There are dozens and dozens of experiments looking at non-pain experiences, fear, emotion, perhaps me looking at a spider, since I can't stand spiders, would, would activate a very similar if not almost identical network in the, in the brain without the actual experience of pain. And so this overlap of areas that play multiple roles has really been the, one of the obstacles for us to be able to move forward and say, this is the network that we should be targeting for treatment. Because if we target that network, we may end up actually having a great number of side effects because we've also affected many other functions that we might not want to mess around with. So in real terms of how it will affect pain management in the future, where are you going with this? Because of this overlap of function, and, and this overlap of function isn't necessarily at the individual nerve cell level or the individual uh, receptor on the nerve cell level. It's a problem with using brain imaging, which um, shows you these you know, blobs in the brain, that those blobs in the brain contain thousands and thousands of neurons that may serve different functions. So I think we need to couple the current brain imaging with some other techniques that will able, be able for us to say, okay, within that blob of activity, some of that is due to fear. Some of it really is the actual ouch experience. And, and so we, we need to be able to look more at a neurotransmitter level or single cell level to see at a much finer scale spatially, but also perhaps temporarily in time. So other techniques like uh, MEG or EEG uh, are, are now being married with uh, MRI to get at more detail as to what's going on within those blobs. Professor Karen Davis from the University of Toronto. Now, Canada has a very strong history in pain research. It dates back to the collaboration between professors Ronald Melzack in Canada and Patrick Wall in the UK. They established the first modern theory of pain back in the 1960s. Dr. Yves de Conning is director of the Quebec Pain Research Network in Canada. They essentially first proposed what is now called in, in medical school the gate control theory of pain. And essentially what they propose is that there is a filtering of your sensory signal in the spinal cord before they relate to the brain. And they were trying to reconcile essentially the psychological experience or everyday life experience about pain with a neurobiological substrate. How is the wiring, how is the neurochemistry in your spinal cord explaining this psychological experience? So tell me if I'm wrong, 
when you say filtering, if I tell you you've won the lottery and I stamp on your foot, at the same time somebody tells me I've just lost my job and stamps on my foot, I would feel different pain to you. So something is happening between my foot and my brain to change how we perceive our foot being stamped on. Absolutely. In fact, the example you give is the one I often give to people, when to students. If I stamp on your foot, it's not in your foot that you feel pain, it's in your brain. It's always in your brain that you feel pain. But between your foot and the brain, it has to go through the nerves, the spinal cord, the lower part of the brain up to the surface of your brain where pain is perceived. So if the signal is altered anywhere along that path, it may lead to an aberrant perception. The same way that the same person doesn't feel pain the same way in two different conditions, the same way that two persons don't feel pain necessarily the same, and so on. And part of it has to do with our body's own ability to control pain sensation. You know, if you're hurt and you need to save your child who's in danger, you'll just go ahead and you won't feel it. And in fact, there's a number of recent discoveries and some of my, of my own research is highlighting that essentially perhaps what happens in chronic pain conditions is that the body's own ability to repress pain in certain conditions is what's failing. What is emerging, I think, is the realization that indeed chronic pain has to do with an abnormal function of your nervous system, of your, of your nerve cells in the spinal cord and in the brain. Therefore, meaning that chronic pain is a disease in itself. One of the long-standing problems in, in we, that we have in the clinic is that people often consider pain as just a phenomenon secondary to another problem. You know, you have cancer, therefore you have pain, you have uh, diabetes, you've been hurt somewhere, you had an operation and you feel pain. The pain is just an, an alarm system that's telling you that there's, there's something wrong. It has a purpose. It has a purpose. But more than that, people say, if it's just secondary to another problem, let's solve the first problem and then the pain will go away. And in many, many situations, it's the pain itself that is the really debilitating component of a disease. So there's a recognition that we need to target this, the pain itself, not just say, let's solve the, the, the problem of the source and the pain will go away. And in addition to that, the realization that the pain in itself may be due to a malfunction of your nervous system and therefore has to be considered as a disease and therefore has to be uh, treated as such. Research has actually highlighted that there are changes that occur in your spinal cord, in the lower part of your brain, inside of certain brain areas that are involved in the perception of pain, where information coming from your body, the sensory, what we call sensory information, is processed abnormally. Like epilepsy, for example. You know, it's interesting, I often give the example that a hundred years ago, Epileptic patients were put in mental health uh, hospitals because they were considered possessed of, uh, and people had no idea what to do. And over the years, you know, we've discovered that epilepsy is just a neurological disease that we can treat very well. And pain is sort of behind in that respect. It's only in the recent years that we are starting to destigmatize regarding chronic pain and realizing that, again, a lot of chronic pain may just be a neurological disease like others and we just have to find uh, the sources and, and, and the way to treat it and then people can go on with their normal lives. So we just have to find the source. You're a researcher, what have you found? <laughs> so I mentioned earlier Patrick Wall and Juan Melzack and their original theory that was essentially saying that there's a filter at the level of your spinal cord where the sensory nerves coming from your skin, from your body everywhere converge information is processed there before it's relayed to the brain where pain is going to be perceived. So how that processing occurs will determine essentially your sensory experience. And many of your body's own ability to repress pain takes place there. This surprises me really. 
you're saying that it, it gets processed or some of it gets processed before it gets to the brain. Yes, exactly. And in a sense, it's, it's actually interesting that it gets processed where it enters right away into your, uh, what we call the central nervous system, the spinal cord in the brain, rather than being processed higher up in the brain. You could say, well, let's just uh, gather everything at the level of the brain and the brain cells will just decide what's, what information is meaningful or not. And you could say, well, maybe it's actually an economic way for our body to, to function is to actually filter signal right away at the entry point so that you don't spend exaggerated uh, energy to, to process it higher up. I'm going to keep with this. This processor in the spine, is it actually filtering it or signaling it in different directions? Is it like a, a railway control, if you like? We, we have all the railway lines and one is sending a train that way and the other is sending a train that way. Is that what's happening? That's very interesting that you, you, you put it that way because for the longest time, uh, there's been this debate in the field as to whether you have essentially one relay one track to take your analogy where all the information converges and somehow the signal gets encoded in there and it's going to be interpreted higher up versus the idea that there may be a whole bunch of different parallel rails that each have to do with certain sensory uh, signals like touch you know uh, stroking touch temperature itching pain and so on and then people have been saying, well, one of the problem with the idea that you have separate tracks is that, well, then the doctor can just go in and cut the wrong track, the one that signals pain, and you're, you'll be fine. And when you do that, sometimes you can relieve pain, but only for a certain time, and then it comes back. Knowledge now is converging to say that indeed there are all of these parallel tracks. And information is essentially channeled in these different tracks. But there is room for crosstalk between these tracks. And this crosstalk is controlled by these control neurons I was telling you about, which you call the local inhibitory neurons. So you have a bunch of pathways, you have all these inhibitor neurons that are repressing the crosstalk between these tracks. But in certain conditions, that control can be lifted a little bit and allow some crosstalk so that normally when I just touch your skin gently it's just perceived as a normal touch signal but if some of the crosstalk between that channel and the pain channel is lifted a little bit some of the information may be going up the pain channel and that same touch will be interpreted as, as pain what people have to see is that this crosstalk can happen at several places from your foot to your brain so that maybe you can cut it at the spinal cord level a specific pain pathway and therefore signal should not go up anymore so if there was crosstalk before you cut then you know you've cut the pain pathway so nothing should go through and you should not feel pain anymore but then that crosstalk can occur higher up and then you will cut again at that level but it can happen again higher up you know, the amazing thing about the brain is it's enormous, what we call in, in, uh, in scientific term, plasticity. It's enormous ability to reshape, reorganize itself constantly. You know, we all know about the cases of people who uh, become blind and the areas of their brain that's normally processes vision is now processing other sensation. And it's, just, it's just amazing how the brain reshapes itself. And it's the same thing with the pain system. You know, you go in and you try to cut the different places or the simplistic uh, neurosurgical approach would be say, you know, just let's go and cut and, and then and then it'll reorganize itself higher up in this form of this crosstalk that I'm telling you about to sort of uh, defeat the doctor. So what we've actually discovered in our research is that this control mechanism that's separating the signal between these uh, tracks is failing in certain chronic pain conditions and what we call neuropathic pain, uh, that pain that's due to a damage to the nervous system, either damage to a sensory nerve or damage to the spinal cord after a spinal cord injury and other, other conditions, for example, the painful neuropathy that develops after diabetes. So 
at the level of the spinal cord, those control neurons are the control mechanism. So the, the nerve cells that are responsible for the control are actually not the one that are initially in trouble. It's the, the neurochemical mechanism. So nerve cells communicate between them through chemicals. Nerve cells are characterized by electrical activity and your brain is like in, in an incredible entanglement of wires where signals goes through and is processed that way. But in between nerve cells, communication is through chemicals. And there are chemicals that are inhibitory and others that are excitatory. So your local control neurons are releasing an inhibitory transmitter that acts on, on nerve cells that will repress their activity. So if you have a whole network, you just repress the activity of some of these interconnecting nerve cells and you prevent the conversation between your tracks going up to the brain. To go into the details of our finding, we actually found that the neurochemical that inhibitory or control neurons are using is, is called gamma aminobutyric acid and, and glycine. They're two small molecules that these cells secrete and that act on neurons to open certain channels, ion channels, that are permeable to chloride ions. A bit technical, but in the end, what is important to understand is that those chloride ions, when they flow into the cells, they actually inhibit the cell. For them to be able to flow into the cells, the cell has to maintain always this chloride ions low in concentration. So that there's a gradient so that they, you know, they will want to flow in not flow out the valves in other words yes exactly that's a very good analogy for them to flow in you have to have something that will maintain the chloride concentration very low in the cells and for that nerve cells have pumps they have little pumps on their surface pumping chloride ions out all the time and it turns out that we found that what happens after injury to a nerve, for example, that the cells in the spinal cord, the neurons in the spinal cord, lose that pump. Chloride ions accumulate inside the cells, and then the, that little inhibitory signal, that transmit, neurotransmitter, neurochemical that the inhibitor neurons secrete and bind to that valve to open it, now instead of causing inhibition to these cells, cause excitation because now there's been chloride accum accumulated in the cell and now chloride ions flow out. So you've inverted your filter into an amplifier, if you want. So you can imagine now that, you know, all these cells that were there to repress the crosstalk between these rails, railways uh, going up your spinal cord is failing. Now. And in fact, not only failing, it's actually perhaps even amplifying it. And that can explain why touch, which should go along its dedicated rail, actually now crosses to the pain pathways and, and uh, signals pain. So we found that originally, and we actually found that this the loss of this pump was actually secondary to a local inflammatory response inside of your spinal cord. Your spinal cord and your brain are very separate from the rest of the body. And your body has its own immune system and there are immune cells. Some of them are called macrophages. There are these little cells in your skin and your body that go uh, survey all the time your body. And whenever there's, there's something uh, foreign entity or whatnot, they go in and, and they chew it up. And then they, they're the barrier, the first barrier against any invading uh, entity. Your brain and spinal cord it has to be protected from some of your immune system. So it has its own internal immune system. So the macrophages of the brain are called the microglia, tiny little cells that are also circulate and travel through your brain and spinal cord all the time and they scan everything and they look for any damage and uh, any degeneration or whatnot to clean it up to let the system uh, regenerate. And several groups are finding more and more is that these microglial cells after an injury or spinal cord injury or peripheral damage or whatnot, they will transform themselves. They will inflate, they will migrate toward the area where the sensory nerves are coming into the spinal cord and they will start doing things. And one of them is to secrete a factor 
which we found is actually responsible for causing the neurons to lose that chloride pump that I was telling you about. So it, it seems that it, in the end, it's actually your immune system, the inflammation inside the spinal cord that is repressing, if you want, your control mechanism to prevent the pain signal to flow through. Anyway, all of these things are, are interesting findings. You might say, well, yeah, that's all very nice, but you know, what is that doing to my grandmother who is uh, in pain? What's very promising for us as researchers is that this research is actually unveiling a number of new molecular mechanisms that may be underlying the development of pain hypersensitivity or, or aberrant pain. New mechanisms automatically means new targets, and new targets means new promises essentially for the pharmaceutical industry to try to develop new drugs that may be helpful to alleviate pain. We're not trying to develop necessary drugs that will come in and repress neuronal activity, nerve cell activity. We're trying to give back to the body its own ability to produce its own analgesia. So you're trying to mend the body rather than reduce the pain? If you want, yes. Let the body just handle the pain in itself. Well, our, each of our bodies, if they're functioning very well, has tremendous abilities to actually repress pain. The advantage of, of a of strategy that's trying to just restore your own body's ability to repress pain is that you may envisage that it may have uh, less side effects. Because if you come with a drug that inhibits nerve cells, like many of these drugs, and many of them are working great at it, they're great tools to treat pain, like uh, morphine, for example. The disadvantage is that with morphine is it acts at many, many places and it may come with, it comes with a lot of side effects. What we call benzodiazepines, uh, Valium or, or the derivatives of that, are also drugs that try to enhance your body's own uh, ability to produce inhibition. These drugs actually don't act by themselves. What they do is they help your body's own chemicals to produce uh, inhibition. Dr. Yves de Conning, Director of the Quebec Pain Research Network in Canada. Now, let me just remind you of Pain Concern's usual words of caution, that whilst we believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound, and they're based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances, and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Now, don't forget that you can put a question to our panel of experts or just make a comment about these programmes via our blog, message board, email, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, pen and paper. All the contact details are at the Pain Concern website, which is painconcern.org.uk. And you can download all editions of Airing Pain from there too. We'll end this programme by picking up on an earlier point raised by Dr. Yves de Conning, and I guess that if we asked 100 people with chronic pain whether they'd rather have their pain suppressed, or have their body restored to where it was before the pain began, then 100 people would say, please put me back to where I was. Yeah, sure. And, and of course, I mean, this is a long and daunting task to, to get there, but it's definitely the, the objective. You start with the idea that chronic pain has to do with a malfunction of the system, secondary to something that happened. Being able to work that back to restore it is the ideal because if you do that you fix the problem once for once and, and for all unfortunately for many 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 diseases like neurodegenerative diseases all that we have as an arsenal is tools to palliate but the more research we do and the more we understand what are the sequence of steps that are driving the uh, nervous system your, your spinal cord in your brain the more hope I think we can have of actually going that, that route of uh, fixing it back for good, if you want. This year, next year, next century? Oh, boy. I mean, th these are discoveries are very exciting for us researchers, but we know what to target. But then the first step is to actually find drugs that will do what we want it to do. That in itself is actually a pretty complicated uh, path. 
But and once you found it, then you have to go through the sequence of testing to make sure that it is not uh, toxic, it doesn't have side effects, and, and so on. So, unfortunately, it takes a long, a long time uh, to get there. But finding the root of the problem, the target, as you call it, is the first step to the holy grail. Absolutely, absolutely, yes.